Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizing committee, on behalf of our host, Trinity International University, on behalf of all our co-host organizations, on behalf of our generous partners and supporters, and for those of you in here from out of town, on behalf of Chicagoland, welcome to the Faith That Works Summit 2018, Chicago! My name is Greg Forster, and it has been an honor and a pleasure to be involved in the summit in a variety of roles uh, for some time now. Uh, if you uh, are in, he in here from out of town, welcome to Chicago. Zip up those windbreakers. It's the Windy City. Get yourself a shovel and a trowel and tunnel your way into a slice of Chicago pizza. If you find the bottom, you win. That's how it works. You know, we do have people from not only all across the country, but all around the world. We have folks here at the summit from India, Africa, the UK, Hong Kong, the Caribbean. And if you see some people walking around on the ceiling, don't be alarmed. It's just the Australians. <laughs> and at least one Kiwi from New Zealand, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> you can't keep them down. You can keep them down under, but you can't keep them down. Well, folks. Fish got to swim, and disciples got to work. That's why we're here to inspire, to equip, and to connect you for collaboration. Because in the kingdom of God, work is all about collaboration. Now, as you know, this is our third Faith at Work Summit. We have listened to your feedback. So we have made just a few changes to the format. Those of you who've been with us before will notice a few things. The plenaries up here are a little different so that we can be more collaborative because we've heard you on that. Uh, and even more importantly, the workshops. We have many more workshops now with uh, focused topics so that you can collaborate really effectively in those workshops. So download that conference app which has the schedule and all the workshops listed and where they are, it will school you on how to get to your workshops. <laughs> all right, so let's get ready to put our faith to work at work. Here to begin us is Catherine Leary Alsdorf, a good friend of mine and uh, known to many of you as well. She is the founder and former director and just very recently, once again, director, redirector of the Center for Faith and Work at Redeemer Presbyterian Church. Catherine, would you please uh, open us with a prayer? Happily. Dear Lord, what is man that you're mindful of him? And who are we that you are mindful of us? In this vast universe and in our contemporary culture, we are such a small part, and yet you've called us. You've called us to this common work and to this place. You have called us to help people know their part in your creation and redemption pro project as they go about their work. You have called us to meet a huge need that your people have for spiritual and theological and community foundations so that your church can humbly bring grace and mercy, truth and light into this broken world. And thanks to all the teams of organizers and collaborators on the summit, you've called us together. Lord, thank you for this unique gathering. Many people who have taught me, encouraged me, and inspired me. Thank you for its mission to learn from each other and spur one another on to love and good work. I confess that it's hard to get away from the demands of our daily work and be fully present here. So we ask you to carry our work burdens for us these next 40 hours. Help us to be present to your spirit and what you want us to learn. Guide the speakers and panelists so their words will glorify you. May this be a time of spiritual renewal. Lord, fill our hearts with hope and love and enliven our imaginations. Unify us in the knowledge of your word and common understanding of the gospel story in which we live and work. That good news story changes everything. It changes why we work, how we work, 
and how you use our work for your purposes. Thank you, Lord, for calling us to yourself. Establish the work of our hands. Amen. Thanks, Catherine. Well, welcome to um, our plenary session tonight, which is titled Further Up and Further In, Taking Faith at Work to the Next Level. My name is Denise Daniels. I'm a professor of management at Seattle Pacific University, where I've been on faculty there for 23 years. Um, I have a strong interest in faith at work and um, have done uh, quite a bit of teaching and research in the area. I've also been on the planning committee for the Faith at Work Summit for the past couple of years. Um, which has been a lot of fun and a lot of work, and we'll be really happy when this week is over. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say a few. Uh, I'm going to say something a little bit later about the further up, further in theme. Um, you might recognize it. It's from um, that the term is from C.S. Lewis's Narnia series, The Last Battle, um, where the the the, um, the kids have returned to a new Narnia and they're exploring and finding new new ways. And it's really a kind of a vision of heaven. We are not in heaven yet. Um, but, but the goal with Further Up and Further In is to kind of explore and to think about the ways that our work can really reflect God's purposes here on earth. Um, one of the th I, I'm supposed to do a couple of things. I've got some announcements to tell you. I know Greg mentioned the app. If you have not downloaded the app yet, you really should. Um, there are instructions in the bag that you were given when you checked in. So there's a little piece of paper that gives instructions about how to do that. So I would encourage you to look at that and make sure that you download it. It does give you information um, about all the sessions, where they are. It has a map. It allows you to message people. So if you want to send messages to somebody else who's registered for the conference, you can. Um, so please, please take a chance and do that. We are going to start this session with what we call tributes. And if you have been to any of the previous Faith at Work summits, you know that one of the things that we do at the summit is to pay tribute to the pioneers, those folks who have paved the way for the Faith at Work movement. Uh, one of the founders of the summit and a leader himself of the Faith at Work movement is David Gill, who is going to be paying tribute to our first two pioneers. Please hold the applause. Yeah, further up and further in. Mine was, my suggestion was not so pale, not so male, but I lost out to the other one. Well, this is a great privilege to pay tribute to, first of all, two of our pioneers. We salute, first of all, Donald E. Flo as a true pioneer and model of a business leader who integrated his faith and integrates his faith with his daily work. Don is the owner and CEO of Flo Automotive Companies, headquartered in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Virginia, and then a diploma at Regent College in Vancouver, which, as you know, is a graduate school of theology explicitly focused on equipping laity and marketplace folk rather than just religious professionals. Uh, Don earned an MBA at Wake Forest University, but he also cho chose to learn the auto dealership business uh, in the trenches from the ground up. He spent time doing the various jobs from technician to services, sales, uh, back office support, then various management positions leading to the top. And starting with just one dealership, Don grew his father's automo automotive business to include 36 dealerships and more than 1,000 employees. From his deep commitment to Christ and his understanding of the application of his faith to work, Don sees his role as a priest meaning to him, one who bears the burdens of the people by absorbing those burdens and bringing them before God, and pastor, one who builds community by inviting everyone to use their gifts for the common good of all. He's put the values of our Lord into his business in so many ways, but by caring for the most vulnerable of all of his customers and employees. For Christians, Don says, there are no little people, quoting Francis Schaeffer, and there's no ordinary work citing C.S. Lewis. He demonstrated the deep commitment to these practices by holding to them through the economic crisis when sales were down 70% and half of his dealerships were selling cars from General Motors, Motors, which had gone into bankruptcy. In an industry that has often had a reputation for high pressure sales and under-delivered quality, Flow Automotive is universally admired for its straightforward and fair pricing and its generosity as well as its reliability after the, after the sales and delivery take place. 
Don has demonstrated that it is possible to run a profitable, growing, enduring, and excellent company with non-negotiable high ethics based on a biblical worldview. Don's leadership has also taken him beyond the auto dealerships to include community development projects, service on numerous boards, mentoring many people, service to his church. He serves on the board of Wake Forest University and is vice chair of Wake, Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. If it weren't for the fact that my 2017 Toyota Hybrid should, should easily outlive me, I would almost certainly be trying to persuade Don to start a dealership in Northern California. Nobody and no business is perfect, but if you're looking for a business that exhibits in depth and in detail the mission and values of our Lord, uh, for my money, you just can't do better than Flow Automotive. Don, we wish you were here. We know you couldn't be, but we salute you, we thank you, and we pray that God will bless your leadership for years to come. We also, uh, at the beginning here, want to honor the memory of Haddon Robinson, who lived from 1931, died just a year ago in 2017. Haddon uh, was a pioneer, faith at work preacher and educator. A native of New York City, uh, Haddon earned his bachelor's degree at Bob Jones, his THM at Dallas Seminary, an MA at Southern Methodist, and the PhD from the University of Illinois. He served three years as a director of Dallas Youth for Christ and two years as associate pastor of First Baptist Church in Medford, Oregon. Hadn't taught homiletics at Dallas Theological Seminary for 19 years, served as president of Denver Seminary for 12 years, and as distinguished pre a professor of preaching at Gordon-Conwell Seminary from 1991 to his retirement a couple years ago. He also did a term as interim president of Gordon-Conwell Seminary. Haddon was a tireless preacher, writer, speaker, and educator who emphasized God's gracious call to faithful discipleship in our daily work. Quote, the word of God will do its work in people's ordinary lives, he often said. He was regularly recognized in polls and surveys across the country as one of America's most influential preachers. He deflected this kind of praise by saying, there are no great preachers, only a great Christ. In an early diary, Haddon once wrote, this man preached for an hour and it felt like 20 minutes. Other preachers preach for 20 minutes and it feels like an hour. I wonder what the difference is. Well, ha later on, Haddon said, I've devoted my life to answering that question. And in brief, the answer from Haddon was to stay grounded in the exposition of scripture when you preach and stay focused on one big idea you want to communicate from God's word. Among his several books that he published, Haddon wrote Biblical Preaching, which is the classic bestseller still used in many seminary uh, preaching courses. The range and reach of Haddon's leadership, preaching, teaching, pastoring, and other service is really stunning and impossible to completely list here. But here are four Faith at Work highlights. First of all, Haddon served as general director of the Christian Medical and Dental Society and editor of the Christian Medical Society Journal uh, from 1970 to, to 1979, helping 7,000 physician and dentist members to find fellowship, encouragement, and resources for bringing their faith to the front lines. At Gordon-Conwell Seminary, he was in 2000 the founding faculty leader of probably the world's first doctor of ministry degree in the church in the marketplace, a program that continues to this day. Thirdly, he was founding president of, in 2007, of the Theology of Work Project with its massive commitment to write a comment, commentary on the workplace lessons of the whole of the Bible. The Theology of Work Project remembers him thus, quote, no room for sentimentalism or cliches, just an unshakable conviction that the best guide for the work men and women do every day is the word of God. And finally, but not le uh, least, uh, for many years, Haddon was the chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, his impact on coach Tom Landry and quarterback Roger Staubach seemed very clear. On the Dallas Cowboy cheerleader cheerleaders, less obvious to careful outside observers. In my opinion, though seriously, Haddon was directly or indirectly the godfather 
of workplace attuned pastors like Larry Ward, Tom Nelson, and others. We honor his memory and legacy. We thank God for him, and we pray that his kind will increase. Thank you. Um, do you guys ever listen to those radio shows where the host has to give ads, like give, you know, tell, tell about a product and how they... So one of my roles as hosting this particular event tonight is talking about our sponsors. Now, this could sound a little bit like an ad, but it's for real um, in that I really think these are really great organizations and I want you guys to think they're really great organizations. So our sponsor for tonight's event, the, the organization that actually is sponsoring um, this plenary is the Theology of Work Project. Um, if you are not familiar with them, they sometimes go by TOW. TOW provides the most comprehensive and trusted single source of biblical material related to work, including the Theology of Work Bible Commentary, Bible Studies, and Devotionals. And they are, you can find them on the web at www.theologyofwork.org. Almost said that wrong. Um, if you have not checked them out, it's really worth, worth doing so. They're a really great organization that provide a lot of services and free materials that you can use in a lot of different contexts in your own work. Okay, I said earlier that I would be framing further up and further in a little bit uh, more, and I want to talk about what that means for us. We're not in heaven, as I mentioned, um, but what does that mean? Um, four years ago in Boston, the main theme of the summit had to do with the, the notion that your work matters to God, and that's certainly an important theme. Two years ago, uh, David Gill did make the point in Dallas that we were a little bit too male and too pale. And um, we, we took that to heart, and we thought really carefully about what does it mean to have a movement that really is only focused on a fairly narrow segment of the population. And we want it to be much broader in how we think about what God is doing at work. And so tonight, we, um, we wanted to, to have you all think about your own work. What is God doing in the context of your work? And in order to do that, we wanted to give you examples of people who are engaging in their faith at work across a real broad variety of sectors. And so you'll hear from four speakers tonight. Um, I, I don't want you to get too nervous. The first speaker is our longest speaker. The others are not gonna talk as long. So don't feel like, wow, we got through that first one and we're only 25% of the way through. That's not true. Um, the, the first speaker is, actually has two jobs and he's gonna set up um, kind of a, a theological foundation and then talk about his own particular um, context. And then the other three speakers are gonna talk about their own particular context only, so they only have half the job to do. Um, the objectives of their work are very different. The contexts in which they work are very different. The nature of their work is very different. And my, our hope is that you all can apply that to your own context. So your work probably is gonna be really different from each of theirs. What is God doing in the context of your work? What is God doing that might surprise you? Um, our four speakers, as I mentioned, represent different industries. The first is from finance. The, the next one will be from medicine, and then from labor, and then from engineering. So quite a, quite a range. Once you have heard from all of them, you're gonna have a chance at your tables to talk about what you've heard and to think about questions that you would like to ask them. They're gonna all four come up at the very end as a panel and you'll have a chance to ask some of those questions. So I'll frame it for you as we go. But we're gonna start with our first speaker who is Andy Mills. Andy is the executive chairman and president of Archegos. It looks like Arch Egos, but he told me not to say it that way. Um, Archegos Capital Management, and he is also the co-chairman of the Theology of Work Project, the former board chair and president of King's College in New York, and a former CEO of Thompson Financial and Professional Publishing Unit of the Thompson Corporation. He has an undergraduate degree from Oxford University, and you'll hear a little bit of an accent, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Uh, the first half of his talk is going to be focused on the biblical foundations of work in finance, uh, sorry, the foundations, biblical foundations of work broadly, and the second half will be focused on um, an application in finance. So please join me in welcoming Andy Mills. Thank you so much, Denise, and good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for spilling my guts about the arch egos thing. It's the last secret I tell you. It's wonderful to be here today. I've actually had to fight off a lot of recruiters from the Big Ten basketball. I don't know if you've noticed that. 
They must be very short this year, but uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun. So I'm glad to be in the right place eventually. So I want to talk uh, firstly about a little bit about the theology of work, if you will, and then talk some more about uh, the way I think about applying that to my own life in the world of finance. Now, let me say up front, when people don't know God's purpose for work, then I would suggest that they neither know why they're working or how they should work, and the result of that, I think, is they ultimately don't fully fulfill the calling that God has for their life. And so tonight, I want to dig a little bit more deeply into the why and then give you maybe a construct for, uh, for the how that I hope will be helpful to you all this evening. You know, when most people start to talk about faith and work and the basis of theology of faith, faith and work, most people start in, in Genesis 2, and they start at Genesis 2.15, a passage you probably all know, where God puts Adam in the garden and he invites him to both uh, work and tend the garden. And, and the theology works from there. And I think it's interesting when you think about that, it, it sort of puts humankind in a position of manager or steward. And we use those words a lot, managing or stewarding God's creation. In other words, it's, it's running something that's already there, that has already been in some way completed. As I think about the theology of work, I'd invite you to I, I should go a little earlier in the, in the chapter, chapter 2, to go to verse 5. And, and what you find in verse 5 is you find that creation has done, the earth is the way it is, um, but it's unproductive. And uh, the scripture very clearly tells us that it's unproductive. But the thing I'd like you to, to think about is everything is there that we're going to need for what we're going to do for the rest of uh, until the Lord comes again. Uh, you know, in the earth, you already have gold, you have oil, you have minerals, resources. They're already there, but that earth is unproductive. And chapter, and chapter 2, uh, verse 5, gives you two reasons that it's unproductive. The first of which is no rain, and I think that's a fairly easy thing for us to think about. No rain, no growth. We get that. But the, th the second reason stated there is there was no man to work it. And obviously, God then solves both of those problems in 2.6, when he brings water, and 2.7, when he forms Adam out of the earth. But let's just pause and think about that a little bit. You know, the earth was kind of like a Lego box full of Lego bricks. You know, my son used to love me to buy these $100, $200 Lego kits. You know the ones? Which he then went and built. But about five days later, you would have found the thing completely destructed. Uh, the, the, the instructions gone, and you ended up with just a pile of bricks, a $200 pile of Lego bricks, probably worth about $18. So we used to put them in a, a big plastic container, and then a bigger plastic container, and we ended just with this massive amount of unusable bricks. And that's kind of how the world was. There were all these pieces and all the parts necessary, but it needed man to begin to put them together. In God's wisdom, and in God's plan, he intended to make us integral to this creation process that we see going on. And God is bringing us from garden to city, making things increasingly complex. More complexity of products and services, more people. Uh, this complexity is part of God's ongoing creation. And that is our role and our responsibility to be almost co-creators. I, I say that hesitatingly, to, to call us a co-creator with God but certainly a co-laborer with God in bringing this creation from its beginning to where it's going to end up. Look around you. Everything that has been produced in this room, in your homes, wherever you might be, has been produced by the ingenuity of humankind in partnership with God. And when we think about that, uh, I, I want you to, to think differently about 2.15, which is where we're kind of managing something that's already there, Verses 2-5, where we come on in and everything is ready for us, but we need to be the ones that create in God's likeness, in his image, with his creativity, with his imagination, to begin to put all those things together to serve our fellow man as we move forward. And, you know, we've done a pretty good job of that. Um, in 1870, for example, there were one billion people on the earth, estimated. Today, we have about 7.2 going on to 7.3 billion, I think. 
And yet, if you think of the standard of living of those one billion back in 1870 versus the standard of living across the world, although there's more to be done, but if you think of the standard of living right now in the world, not only have we multiplied the number of people by seven times, but the standard of living is vastly greater. That's all being created by humans working as co-laborers and co-creators with God through that process. I spend a lot of time in Africa, and I see the difference that uh, medical products, medical uh, facilities make to the population. The average life expectancy of the African has moved from late 30s to mid 50s because in many places now of those medical facilities and those capabilities, things that man have created to help flourishing of other, of other man and the humankind. I see cell phones being used all over the place, and you say, well, how does that help? Well, it creates markets and places where people can bring product and sell them more effectively and more accurately. And I see microfinance and missing middle finance helping to raise businesses across all of Africa uh, to raise the living standards and create work and jobs for people. It's, it's man working for a fellow man and developing God's creation. I stand here tonight on two titanium hips. Uh, I was virtually crippled, could hardly walk, and yet the imagination of mankind, the people in the medical industry, to think about how to alleviate that kind of suffering and to think about how to create these metal implants to help people walk. It's, it's a walking example to me every day of the theology of work and what we're called to do as people. So why do we work? Well, because God invites us to be co-laborers in progressing his creation for his glory, for human flourishing, and also importantly, I think, for personal satisfaction. We're created in certain ways. We're given gifts, each of us differently. And one of the things God invites us to do is we use those gifts to his glory. Uh, he will use us for the purpose for which he has created us. And in doing so, it brings us great satisfaction as we work and we enjoy using his gifts for his glory. I think I just want to challenge us and say, I think this understanding of this co-creation role is very different from the management stewardship role we normally talk about. And I really want to challenge us to think about how does that understanding change the way we think about work? I would suggest to you it, it has to change it dramatically. Well, if that's what I want to say about why we work, I want to also say something, if I could, about how we should work. Now, the Bible has much to say about how we should work, uh, so it's not strange to, to many people the, the, ru the rules and, and the ideas that God brings to bear. Now, whether we, we're obedient to them, that's a different question. But tonight, I don't want to talk about lots of different things. I want to focus on one topic in particular. I want to talk about inviting you to think about adopting the role of the oikonomon. Now you say, what the heck is an oikonomon? Two words in Greek, oikos meaning home, nomos meaning law. So oikonomon is the one that brings the law to the home or the master or the steward. And in fact, it's interesting that the word is found 10 times in the New Testament, um, several times in the book of Luke, including the shrewd manager, uh, is called an oikonomon, a manager. But actually in different places in the New Testament, the translation becomes slightly more different, and listen to some of the phrases which, which is translated this word oikonomon. So for example, in 1 Corinthians 4, the oikonomon is described as the steward of the mysteries of God. In Galatians 4.2, the oikonomon is translated as the guardian of a son by a father. And in 1 Peter 4, we see that the oikonomon is the faithful steward of God's grace. These are not managers. These are not stewards. This is a level of entrustment that God has given to these, to these men and women. They are entrusted ones. In particular, if you think about God giving you his, a son or a father giving a son as to a guardian, you know, a guardian just doesn't manage that son. What a guardian does is to think about being the father of the son. How do I train him up? How do I think about giving him 
education, how do I think about teaching him what it means to be a man, how to work, all the things that he will need to know. That's what a guardian does. It's not a passive role. It's a very active, creative role. And that's what we're called to do. God has given us something he loves very much. He's given us his creation, and he's given us his people for us to be the entrusted ones to work with them. Think about the place that God has put you in your own work life right now. Whether it's the boardroom or the janitorial closet, we all have a place to work and we all have people to work with. What does it mean to be God's trustee? You know, to be a real trustee or an ambassador, we really un need to understand the person who we're being the ambassador for. We need to model and reflect that person accurately in the world in which we're working. We need to know his nature and his character. We need to be yoked with Christ for us to be successful as an oikonomon in the workplace. Now, I love Psalm 89, 89, 14, you know, that describes the king of kings and describes the foundation of his throne. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of the throne and loving kindness and thankfulness and faithfulness go before him. You know, here's the king of kings saying, this is the foundation of my throne, righteousness and justice. And if you do searches on righteousness and justice throughout all the Old Testament, you'll find many, many instances of it, and it nearly always talks about leadership. The characters of leadership are righteousness and justice. So when I think about being an oikonomon, or I challenge you to think about being an oikonomon, as I think about reflecting God in your work, righteousness and justice have to be the pillars of your throne. We need wisdom and strength. We need purposeful pursuit of God, abiding in Christ, as John 15 will tell us. What part of God's creation has God given you to be his trustee? How do you represent him? What changes can you bring? How do you bring righteousness and justice into that place? How can you lift up people? How can you create product? All of the things that God wants you to be doing as an oikonomon. Are you yoked with Christ? Well, that's a bit about the how. When we think about being God's co-laborer on the one hand, and we think about being his trustee on the other, what a privilege that he has chosen us to be his instrument of creation, to be his instrument of reconciliation, to be his instrument of creativity. How dare we say, thank God it's Friday? How dare we moan when we go to work on a Monday morning? How dare we think about work in utilitarian terms? How dare we emphasize the spiritual sacred, sacred divide, the, the uh, sacred spiritual divide? How dare we simply think of work as a way of amassing wealth or power or status? You see, how we understand the purpose of work defines why and how we work. And we need to get that right if we are to be the men and women in the workplace that God wants us to be. And we need to help others see that too. So how do I see this working in my own life? The why and the how for me. Why finance? Well, I have to say that's not necessarily the most popular role to be running a hedge fund in New York City. Um, most people would stone you in the Christian community and obviously wonder what, the, what on earth you're spending your life there for. But you see, everything you see in this room and everything you own or use exists because somebody financed it. It's integral to who we are and what we're doing. Finance is simply the method by which financial allocation can take place over time to balance supply of demand for money on the one hand and productive purposes on the other. To make it simpler, if you want to start a business and I have, some, I have excess capital, you don't have the money, I can come to you, I can give you the money, 
you can hopefully become productive with the money I've given you, and out of the excess that you've created, you pay me back and give me a premium. Both can win. That's the value of finance. And interestingly enough, the modern financial world also allows for risk-reward trade-offs to be made. And also it allows for strangers to invest with each other. That leads to a tremendous flow of capital and abundance. It's absolutely what we need to continue to grow. It's very clear if you look at countries that thrive, they have number one, the rule of law, number two, a good education system, number three, an efficient financial capital market. Without those, it's hard to grow. That's what we do. That's why we do it, because we believe that finance is God's plan for how to share abundance so that more abundance can be created, and without it, we will be impoverished. What we do is we pick our particular company. We're in the business of public equities, and we do, what we do is we pick companies and invest in companies that we think have great ideas and great products and can make a difference, and at the same time, we withdraw capital from those companies that we think have had their best day, are not thinking wisely about investments, are not creating great products any longer. Because unless you do that, the good companies with the new ideas often are starved of capital. And the old companies with the bad ideas just continue to roll in the cash, and they really don't progress society particularly. So there's that balancing act that takes place with capital. The second thing that's also very important about the financial markets, it's very important to have fair prices. Particularly when so, many's, so many people's, uh, their retirement is these days covered in 401ks, tied up in 401ks, you need fair pricing in the equities markets. That's fair for all. And so that's the reason that we're in the world of finance because we think it is a God a given, and the, the, the scripture talks about money and the use of money very, very often. In fact, the, the word money appears op more often than love. I'm not quite sure I like that, but it does in the Bible. So if that's why I do it, how do I do it? Uh, to me, the most important thing for me to think is how can I be an economon in my firm? And when you think about finance, finance is really all about human beings. It's, it's about creativity, it's about the integrity, and it's about uh, the, the great thoughts that can come out of the minds of people as they look and invest and, and, and think about analysis of companies and opportunities. So simply, as I think about Noikonomon, creating a culture then that allows people to flourish and grow. That's my main task. I make people the priority. How do we do that? Number one, we started the mission statement. The first thing you have to do is, why are we here and how are we going to do it? Our mission statement has three components to it. We say we want to be a model firm in three ways. Number one, superior return. We have to have that. But number two, we want to be known for the growth, both personal and professional, of our people. And number three, we want to be known as servants in our community, for service to our community. Many people have mission statements and say, we want to be the best at X, Y, or Z by the work of our great people. We've actually turned this around. We've actually made people part of the mission statement. They're that important for us. Everything we do revolves around the people and the people that we have. We then have a value statement that backs that up, which is purely and simply a very simple statement of how we want to interact with each other. That's all a value statement is. How do you interact with each other? And we lay out all the things that are good and the things that are bad. But you've got to do more than that because you've then got to reinforce all of that in every action that you have. So we reinforce those values and that mission statement in our recruiting process. We, we have a very tight shield at the front of our recruiting process to make sure that people will fit those criteria. We have an evaluation process that takes place regularly during the course of the year and finishes at the end of the year. And then compensation is also based on our value system and how people perform, but also how they fit our value system. In fact, there are three things we look at when we, when we pay our bonuses at the end of the year. Number one is what have you done in terms of the output? Number two is, how have you reinforced the culture? And number three is, how have you grown somebody or some people in the organization? And if you get one, great performance, but you don't have two or three, 
you don't get much of a bonus. And it's very clear what our values and our culture is. We invest in people all the time. Learning is a key aspect of our organization. If people are going to grow and we say we want people to grow, then we've got to teach them. You'll see very regularly in our organization, we have a thing called JSU, Just Show Up Book Club. We, we read books together, the whole firm. We just sit down and for an hour, we'll listen to the book maybe for 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll have a 50, 20, 50 minute discussion about it. We're all learning at the same time. We're all thinking about the same concepts at the same time. We are Drucker fans. And we've read a lot of Peter Drucker, and if you haven't, I thoroughly recommend it to you. But so we're all learning at the same time. The result uh, speaks for itself. You know, we've had, uh, over the last four and a half years since I've been at the firm, we have had not one, per well, not one person leave in the financial community, which is typically constantly pulling people away and, 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 and trying to take people from one organization to another. Why have we done that? How have we done that? Purely and simply by investing in people and having people know and understand that we care for them. One of our, one of our values is love. You don't see that very often in a corporate statement. <laughs> but we express that in all the things that we do, and we reinforce it from the top. It's the only way to do it. That's how I try to behave as an oikonomon. I want to bring the love of God into my community. I want to see people grow and develop. I want them to know clearly where they stand, and I want to make sure that they become great investors, because one of our goals is to have people leave our organization and form their own firms at some point when they're ready. And to know that we have trained a great investor who has high ethics and great long-term thinking with an opportunity to be a great investor to provide a place where uh, others can invest in their firm. That's our goal. Our, our, our long-term objective is to have a whole plethora of firms out there that have the same concept and the same values. And we want to plant a flag for Christ in the middle of New York City, in the middle of this competitive world of finance. And we want to be able to show that we perform better than other people because of the quality of our people and the way we treat them. Will that always happen? No, but that's our goal. And it is so fun to see people come together. It is so fun to see the work out and it's so fun to see people grow that it's worth all the effort and the time that we put into it. But there's one other thing also about the world of finance, and as we think about our organization, it's what do we do with the excess? So one of the things we have is a Grace and Mercy Foundation. It's an integral part of what we do at Archegos. It's a big uh, uh, foundation. And w the foundation is actually on the same floor. It's very much integrated with our investment side. In fact, we think of Grace and Mercy as an investment arm. It just invests in not-for-profit organizations as opposed to Archegos, okay, who invests in for-profit organizations. But we grow the people and hold the people to the same standards on the, on the investment side because we want our people to see the importance of philanthropy. There is a, there is a responsibility uh, when you earn money to think about how to use that money to think about others who are less fortunate, to think about organizations that need help, to think about people around the world that need something very different. And so we, we, we uh, all of our people liaise together, they work on, uh, on the uh, not-for-profit uh, uh, recommendations, they go out, they visit, we bring in uh, not-for-profit organizations. So one day you can have 12 ex-prisoners sitting in our conference room, and then 10 minutes later you can have a CEO of a bank sitting there. We do it seamlessly because people have to understand that they need to live a holistic life. And what we try to do is model that for them in everything that we do. So that's how we try to be the oikonomon. That's the how and the why of finance. You know, that's what we do. That's why we think about how and why. How about you? What's the how and the why, or should I say the why and the how for you? God invites us to be co-laborers in progressing his creation for his glory and for the love of our neighbor. Let's, let's all get on board with that concept. Thank you.
as I said, we will now have a chance to hear from three other folks who are going to be talking about the ways that they are able to integrate their faith in a, a, a broad, broad spectrum of organizational contexts. I'm going to introduce all three right now, and then they're going to each come up um, subsequent to each other. I'm not going to come up in between each one. So first, we will hear from Dr. John Yoon, who is going to share his perspective on how faith and work are integrated in the context of medicine. Uh, Dr. Yoon is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Chicago and an assistant, the assistant program director for the internal medicine residency program at Mercy Hospital and Medical Center. He's an academic hospitalist, a clinical ethicist, and a medical educator with research interests in the field of virtue ethics, moral psychology, and moral and professional formation in medical education. Um, after John, we will have Nancy Alderson McDonnell come up, and she is going to share a labor and union perspective with us. Nancy is the president and CEO of Value of the Person, an organization that has been working to build trust and engagement between labor and management in manufacturing companies around the country. She is the co-author with Wayne Alderson, who is her father, of the book Theory R Management, Developing the Principles of Love, Dignity, and Respect. She actually started working with him out of college at Pitrin Steel, helping to facilitate labor management relationships as a Christian. And by the way, as an aside, um, tomorrow night there will be a film showing of The Miracle of Pitrin, which will talk to, tell the story of Pitrin Steel. That will happen at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. Um, Nancy is now doing consulting with a number of steel and manufacturing companies with the goal of helping management see the dignity and purpose of laborers. And then finally, we'll have David Roberts, who is going to talk about how he engages his faith at work in the context of aerospace engineering. David joined the Boeing Company as a propulsions engineer from the University of Arizona in 2012 after receiving his engineering degree while playing Division I football at Arizona. He is currently a components engineering manager for Boeing Global Services and serves on the boards for multiple Christian organizations in the Seattle area. So we're going to start with uh, Dr. John Yoon, and if you'll join me in welcoming him. I do want to thank the organizers of this conference for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this. This is my first faith and work uh, conference that I've attended, so I'm really grateful to be here. I'm a general internist, um, a medical educator, and I should say that I primarily work in an academic setting, um, which often leads to conversations with my daughters that go something along the lines of, Dad, are you a real doctor? <laughs> Why, honey? Well, you never seem to wear your white coat, and it seems like you're mostly on your computer. Uh, to which the way I sort of correct that misimpression is to go to the, take her to the doctor's lounge, the symbol of ultimate privilege in the hospital, open up a refrigerator with a lot of cookies and chips and all, this, all, this, all the kinds of stuff, and say, here, see, I told you, I'm a doctor. Only a doctors can come here. <laughs> so. Personally, it's been a joy for me these past months reimagining um, what it would look like to take faith and work to the next level, particularly in my own field of medicine. Um, medicine actually has a pretty long history and tradition of integrating faith and medicine. I mean, the practitioners, um, I would call it a tradition of integrating faith and medicine, um, particularly if you look at the respect with respect to Christianity. Um, I could think of in the early Christian church of um, the early Christians um, during the plagues in the second and third century, um, uh, the Christians saw it as their act of Christian charity and agape love to be caring for the ill, um, which went against the grain of the pagan culture at the time. Um, even growing up as a Christian pre-med, um, I, I didn't actually ask those types of questions of does my, does medicine matter to God? Um, it was a little bit of a foreign question to me, at least as a Christian pre-med looking in. Um, because, you know, um, I would grow up reading scriptures like Luke 5, 5, 32, where Jesus describes a vision of the kind of work that he came to do, saying, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Add that to the abundant evidence in the Gospels where you see Jesus healing the sick, the collective impact of all that um, as a young Christian was that the profession of medicine is a noble kind of work. Medicine does matter to God. Dr. Farr Curlin writes, uh, he's a 
palliative care physician at Duke and a mentor of mine, writes very eloquently about how the practice of medicine can reflect and should embody the Christian story. And as Curlin notes, quote, creation is good, creation is fallen, creation must be redeemed. In the same way, medicine is created as a good gift. With all creation, medicine is fallen and becomes one of the powers and principalities which order our lives in idolatrous ways. And along with all creation, medicine will ultimately be redeemed in the age to come. And in between time, it is our task to happily participate in God's work by responding to the calling to serve in the vocation of medicine, to make the flourishing of the body our concern so that our patients can return to the task that is given to all, the task of knowing, loving, and serving the Lord." End quote. So though much can be said in the ways that medicine as part of creation is a good gift, I actually want to focus a bit uh, on the ways that medicine, like the rest of creation, is fallen. And that was a story that I didn't, listen, I didn't hear as a Christian pre-med coming in. And so after now 20 years of going through the process of being a doctor, um, I actually now start to ask myself, what is any of this work I'm doing right now? Does that matter to God? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the ways that medicine has fallen that lead Christian physicians to start asking these types of questions. And you've probably heard of um, the epidemic, epidemic of physician burnout um, these days that are rising uh, in our profession. Um, Dr. Curlin often notes that too often to practice medicine Christianly is taken to mean simply pruning morally controversial practices such as abortion or euthanasia from conventional medicine and then presenting the purified version with a dose of warmth and a search for opportunities for evangelism. But he argues that it misses an important point, which is an important prophetic witness that Christians in medicine can make is to actually name and reject the dehumanizing cultural structures and idolatrous tendencies that turn medicine or even health itself into a god. Theologians Joel Schumann and Brian Volk write, medicine primarily functions among the powers we contend by occupying a revered social position through which it appears to wield nearly sovereign control over life and death. There's no apparent limit to medicine's ambition to control the circumstances of human life and death by bringing them under human control, and few people seem interested in asking whether and to what extent such an aim is appropriate for creatures of a providential God. The powers, they write, in their fallen states make pretentious claims and seductive promises. They offer us what we want, and so we esteem them and yield to their authority that they should not have. Along similar lines, theologians Stanley Harawas and Gerald McKinney also highlight the question of medicine's fallenness, and they take the reference of a patient's prayer that goes, this is another day, O Lord. I know not what it will bring forth, but make me ready, Lord, for whatever it may be. If I am to stand up, help me to stand bravely. If I am to sit still, help me to sit quietly. If I am to lie low, help me to do it patiently. If I am to do nothing, let me do it, do it gallantly. The medical vocabulary of contemporary medicine, these theologians argue, give the illusion that we can escape illness and mortality, but it cannot make sense of this patient's prayer. As a result, physicians and patients take death too seriously, and they distort the kind of care medicine is capable of giving. Thus, the idea of seeing the eternal within the finitude of medicine is to relativize death, to be free from its enslavement, and thereby to gain a true understanding of medicine as a gift, one that helps us achieve lives of joy even in the shadow of the cross. But in the last minute, though medicine has fallen, medicine can be redeemed. And how are Christians in medicine participating in God's redemptive work when they work towards the flourishing of the body while affirming the good in fallen human structures for our common good of shalom? Christians throughout the history of medicine have viewed the practices of medicine as a particularly fitting space in which sacrificial Christian love could be embodied. Drawing on the example of Christ's incarnation, a common theme for these Christians has been to identify with others' humanity in the midst of suffering by embodying faithful presence to the sick, the marginalized, and the least of these through practices of hospitality to the stranger. The experience of illness itself, Stanley Harawas observes, 
often makes us the stranger to each other. In closing, um, there, there's a perspective that I could share as a physician in the ways that we participate in uh, the redemptive work of medicine. And there are often hidden unsung heroes in the whole healthcare system besides physicians who actually teach me what it means to do the little things with great love. And to them, I hope I'll be able to have a conversation further uh, in the question and answer. So thank you. I am very blessed to be here with all of you this evening. And I'm very blessed to have been invited by my dear friend, Al Arisman, who was the dear friend of my father, Wayne Alderson, who has passed away. Um, but he is certainly proud that we are here tonight, I know, and that we are here to talk about the value of the person and continuing to carry that legacy forward as each one of us find ourselves in work situations with people who need to be loved and to be valued. And so I've had the great opportunity, having worked with my father with the value of the person for 35 years, and now 40 years, to work with companies and work with foundries and to work with factories and factories and hospitals to bring a message of the value of the person, of dignity and respect, but most important, about love. To people that others often don't pay attention to, our hourly workers, our union employees, the blue collar, that really make things work. And people that perhaps have not been a major topic of the faith at work discussions. And so I'm fortunate to go into companies and organizations called by people who want to begin to say, what does it mean for us to truly build a culture of relationships that are based on people. Not that we have it on our signs on the walls, but because we have it with people touching the hearts of one another. And when I go into organizations, I always ask this question. And so I thought I'll ask the question of all of you this evening. And that is, is there anyone here who does not want to be treated with value and love and dignity and respect. Is there anyone here that does not want that? If you think about the home that you left to come here, do you think that there's anyone there in your home that does not want to be treated with value and love and dignity and respect? And what about all of us who are find ourselves in organizations and in the workplace. Is there anyone that's working for you or with you that doesn't want to be treated with value and with love and dignity and respect? I think we found something that we all have in common. People hunger to be valued. And what I find in our workplaces and the people who are there that are doing the work, that come to work to make a living, they hunger to be valued and to be seen. And I'm very privileged that with the value of the person as I begin to share that message of love, that I see people becoming more purposeful they build relationships, and they see that things can be different. The value of the person, as we come to share, and as I work with organizations and in foundries and factories, I find that it's good that it really didn't come out of academia. It came out of the bowels of a foundry called Pitron Steel, where there was individuals there, management and workers, who hated each other 
And then there was a person, and I'm blessed that that person was my father, Wayne Alderson, who said that things don't have to be the same and we can change. And he began to challenge and to look at the hearts of his people to say that we can love one another and what does that need to look like? And so that began a great transformation the story of truth and renewal, and I do hope that all of you come to see the movie, the documentary, tomorrow at 4.30, because you will really be able to see what happens when hearts are transformed. So the Value of the Person movement was rooted in a truth and in a story and in a place where it was proven to be true. So today, when I go in workplaces, I hear things like this, and I wrote them down. People don't value me. They look down on me. I'm left out of the conversation. And I was at this particular company, and there was a gentleman in the audience, and his name was Abraham. And he looked at the manager behind him, and he said, I just want you to know my name. I think my name is Yo. Yo, go get me this. Yo, go do that. Yo, get over there. And he looked at her and he said, I want to be called Abraham. In secular companies that I work in, I cannot preach Jesus, but I can preach love and dignity and respect. And you know, all love is of God. And it doesn't matter who you are and where you are and what you do. When you experience love, something changes. And the great thing is that every person in this room, so you all work somewhere. You all work somewhere. And you say, we found what we have in common. And I would think I would have asked you the question. I'm sure probably most of us would say that, yes, we value one another. We value one another. I would just want to know what the people around us say about us. And you see, that's where it comes. See, I'm in the process of sowing seeds of love. And I know this, when workers experience loving acts of kindness, when someone knows their name, it brings magnitude and meaning to the purpose that they are there to do their job. They are no longer just a chipper, but they're an ambassador for something more, for goodness, for kindness, for value, and for love. And so I speak for workers. And I'm going to show a quick video here. It's just a short one minute that I want you to hear for some of the people that I have been part of, the blessing and the fortunate to be part of. The one gentleman is Anduhar, and the other gentleman is Leonard. And I want you to hear their voices because they have found purpose in their workplace now, that they have found an opportunity for them to be seen as people. And in that, they have found such great worth that their mission is not just to be the chipper or the sand washer or the core baker, but their mission now is to change the lives and the hearts and the environment to be salt and light where they've been placed. So listen and meet Andahar and Leonard. It's an honor and a privilege to meet all of you all. And I've been with the company a little bit over 13 years. And I'm a welder in CNF. And my outlook for the VOP is just showing love. The Bible says, well, love and kindness have I drawn thee. And this is the second group that we've drawn to to want to, you know, get to know this a little better. And that's that's all we're trying to do is show love because it, it changes lives. And that's all we're trying to do is change lives for the good. DLP 
is VOP, is you. You are VOP. VOP is what you make it. And if you have the right heart, and it starts a, it's a heart condition that we have to have when we're dealing with one another. If the heart is right, then right things will get re right results. But if the heart is not right, then we won't get wrong results. So I just say this, and just like he said, it's all about love, loving one another, being able to agree to disagree, and just come up with results. That's what it's all about. And so these men that you just saw are men that have captured a great spirit to say their work is more than just what they do. It's about who they are. And so I ask all of you to be as strong and courageous as Andahar and Leonard, and to go forward and see that every person here can inspire others to make a difference. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I just want to uh, first and foremost thank the Lord for uh, allowing us to gather here today. Um, I live in a nation where a lot of things are going on, and um, I think it's just quite beautiful that we're able to actually join here and with the opportunity in a country like uh, that we live in today. I also want to just um, also thank Al, who um, invited me here. I do appreciate it. Also for the mentorship. Um, um, so I'm just pretty excited to be here for this weekend. This is my first summit. so. Uh, see how it goes. So as was mentioned, um, I decided to do something crazy when I uh, went to the University of Arizona and I studied aerospace engineering as well as played football, um, which was pretty brutal for five years. Um, but it taught me a lot and uh, I think the, the lessons that I'm going to go ahead and walk through uh, for my faith at work um, actually were built in that college stage. Um, so I grew up in Southern California. I got a scholarship to go to the University of Arizona, chose my major in aer aerospace engineering. They said, you can't do both. There's no possible way. I said, I'm going to go ahead and give it a try, because um, my mom always said, hey, only God can tell you what uh, you can and cannot do. <laughs> and uh, it was a great lesson that I did learn, because I actually did end up graduating aerospace engineering major. And I did, it was a four-year letter winner. So it was a great accomplishment, but the biggest thing that I got in college wasn't those two things, it was uh, my deep faith, because I had a, a coach who actually um, led a Bible study um, that I participated in. Um, ended up graduating, and then I was uh, fortunate enough that God chose to place me at Boeing, and I really do believe that, and that's where my official uh, journey began. I was a propulsion engineer, and then I did that for two years, got to fly around the Pacific doing flight testing. I then uh, transitioned to a more uh, customer focused uh, when I was an airline support engineer. Uh, so for some time, I had 25% of the 787, it's our new airplane uh, fleet I was managing on the engineering management side. A uh, great experience there as well. And then I transitioned to our new Boeing Global Services. Um, that's our new business that we're building um, as a uh, component engineering lead. And then today, as was just mentioned, I'm the component engineering manager. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about two statements that I think um, do a really good job, one communicating what it is that I actually do as an engineer, and then um, also um, how my faith and then also God's word um, prepares me for the different obstacles that I face um, as an engineer. The first statement is design for completion build to last. Now, at a pretty big bureaucratic company, as Boeing is, um, that statement, yes, yeah, sounds good. Um, but what that really means is lots of pressure, lots of pressure on the engineers, lots of pressure on the mechanics. And I'm going to read two, Bible, uh, uh, two verses in the Bible, and then I'm going to talk about um, some examples of how I kind of try to live up to that statement. Uh, so the first uh, verse is Luke 14. 28 to 30. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man has begun to build and was not able to finish. The next verse is uh, Matthew 7, 24 through 
27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the flood came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew, it beat against the house, and it fell, and, a, and great was the fall. At Boeing, I, I've had the opportunity to see lots of projects, negative and positive, and I also get to see that at the end of the day, the pressure is always the same. Um, it's usually upper management, because quite frankly, if we don't sell airplanes, we don't have a job. And um, in essence saying, you gotta hit that date. And usually those dates are always pulled to the left. And the engineers always say, hey, I can only do it in two years. And they say, sounds good, you got a year. Um, so you start off behind the, behind the eight ball. Um, but in that, what I found is that my faith in those two verses that I read has actually been a way that I have been able to deal with that in a way that even though I may be young, I, I can often see how others who aren't yet equipped with that, those spiritual foundations, um, can actually tend to struggle with that. And I'll tell a story about that. So I was a, a young engineer, and I started propulsion engineering. I'm doing flight testing, and uh, we actually had a test that we were running on the engines, and um, one of the engines, the, the data didn't come back as we expected. And we were trying to debate whether or not we should just let it pass. Um, so in essence, we were trying to use the data to talk our way out of the analysis. And my lead and kind of my own personal opinion was, no, we should probably redo this test. But redoing that test, which is usually around a two-day test, was gonna cost us a lot of money. And at the time, I didn't know how much money that was. So during a meeting, I kind of made a statement that I think that we can redo this test and my director looked me right in the eyes and said, you think? Um, just so you know, a day is worth a million dollars. He said, we are flying an engine because someone took the wrong road and we're gonna spend a million dollars to get it here on the day it's supposed to be here. So there's no thinking here. So with that, I actually learned a good lesson because I said, I will go find out whether or not we can actually do it. Um, and it was at Boeing, I gotta make sure that I count the cost that I gotta, I gotta live that out and to be prepared actually beforehand because I believe that's what Christ is saying. He's saying you gotta be deeply ingrained in the word. Um, so to move on to my second point, I'll go ahead and uh, bring up the second statement. Deliver positive and oftentimes negative results with no fear. And I think that's important, especially at a big company at Boeing which is, as an engineer, we often know that we can kind of use data to tell a story, either which way. And I know a lot of people who don't deal with data may think that's kind of crazy, but if you have a very complex model that's analyzing something over 10 years and you have so many equations, no one really knows exactly what's going into that. So there is opportunity for you to tweak things to come up with a positive message. And when people are looking for a positive direction, because quite often a lot of engineers are told, you are only standing in the way of us making progress. So if you're an engineer, you know what that, what that means. Um, so what I've learned is that you gotta be willing to actually make that negative um, statement, that you have to be willing to tell the truth. And I think a verse that really sticks with me um, is Proverbs 12, uh, 19. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. And that's something that as an engineer, I know I have to hold on to, uh, knowing that it's worth taking maybe a short-term loss and standing on to truth uh, because God will be faithful. Um, this last year, I really have uh, seen God do that in my life. I actually had to deliver some very, very bad news um, for a very large program. And I took opposition all the way up to the vice president level, um, sometimes thinking actually might be fired. I remember driving into work thinking, 
yeah, I, I, I have to say this. I am going to hold on to the truth. And I think that's why the biggest thing as Christians that I would like to communicate um, is we have to be willing to push past the fear. We have to be willing, just as Christ tells us, to die uh, for that cost. Um, so that is the culmination of how I try to live my life, very young career, so still got a lot of things to learn. Um, but I'm just thankful for uh, everything that God has allowed me to um, pursue, and then also for um, following through on his word to show me that um, his word will not stand in void because there was a positive um, outcome of that. I actually was thanked by the same people who originally were pushing me to change my analysis. Um, so thank you, and I, I think it's time for the Q&A. One of the questions that got a lot of, a lot of points, um, points, thumbs up, whatever this is, um, is for Andy. And Andy, this question asks, could you discuss your distinction between us as co-creators versus managers and stewards? Uh, yes, let me be uh, brief, because I know we have a lot of other questions. But I think it's, the, it's, it's when I look at uh, Genesis 2.15 versus Genesis 2.5. And just to repeat, Genesis 2.15 is God puts the man in the, in the garden which is a sense of the garden is already there. Uh, yes, he's there to look after it and tend it, but there's not the sort of the same creative uh, imperative around that. Whereas if you think about 2.5, there is nothing there. And there are all the, all the tools and everything ready to go and all the raw materials, but there's nothing specifically there. And that it's not, it's specifically said it's not product, productive for two reasons, one, the rain, and secondly, because there was no man to work it. And so I take from that this, this imperative that man exists for anything to be created at all. And so that's where I come up with the, the sense of the co-creator rather than just the manager or the steward. And I think it was really interesting because after you talked about the, uh, um, I'm not going to say it right, the economo, economia? Economa. Economa, thank you. Um, e each of the other speakers really talked about that in their own setting. I mean, they talked about the ways that they were carrying that out. Yeah, and, and really I thought when you saw the two, the Nancy, the, the video, they're two oikonomon right there. Yeah. I mean, doing exactly what we're talking about. That's a wonderful example. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to combine two questions here. One of them is, uh, has to do with love. And it says, love was promoted as a value by more than one speaker. In a secular setting, how do you maintain the distinctives of a Christian love as opposed to a New Age one? And I'm going to combine this with a question that's right now at the top, which is, how do you lovingly fire people? And so I want to combine those two questions, which is, what does love really look like as a Christian, and how does that differ from what our culture might think of as love? And... Um, Maybe I'll pick on Nancy and John on this one, just because both of you did talk about love in your in your context. Can either of you respond to that, or both of you? Um, well, I think that um, in terms of uh, how do you fire someone <laughs> lovingly in the workplace, no matter where we are. We always say when you bring the value of the person in, it does not mean that you don't still have the job that you need to do. And so you have a standard, you have a workplace, and you have uh, certain things that you need to do. So it's not maybe what you do or what you say, but it's how you say it and how you do it. And so one of the things that we talk about is with dignity, is you need to become great at leaving a person better than you found them. And so you think about how do you go to that person, how do you make sure of the situation that you have them in, that you don't uh, deal with them in front of their peers, that you, you or value you know, who they are in that way. And that you, uh, we have a company that we work with, and you know they sometimes, you know, you just have to help them to get another position going, but that you need to, um, you know, take a look at how you do it, and that uh, they may not feel valued or loved, but you need to make sure that in your own heart that you have, at least, made sure that you, in the best way you can, leave them better than you found them. I, I've. 
I haven't been in a position where I had to fire anyone. I'm probably more likely to be in a position to get fired. Um, but <laughs> I, um, I think with um, the healing ministry of, of medicine, um, I mean, there's so many ways to approach it, but I, I, the thing that really draws me right now is love that is willing to be a faithful healing presence, and I'm not talking about sort of employing all the technologies of medicine, um, not just in that respect, but actually just being a faithful healing presence to someone in pain. I think that's just really hard to do, and it takes actually a lot of love to be able to just sit and be faithfully present with someone in the midst of their pain. Actually, as a doctor, I'd rather just give an antibiotic, say, okay, go. You got, you got something? You got, you got some flu-like symptoms? You know it's a virus, but you want your antibiotic? Okay, just go. But it actually takes a bit longer to sit down and say, you know what, let's talk about this. I know it's, it, you know, it bothers you, your nose are running, but, you know, I, I'm telling you, this is, not a bac this is not bacteria or the antibiotic. You know, so that's just a s sort of a small example. But, but you can go to even larger, I mean, more um, serious examples of folks who are suffering the ends of life. And what, what would it mean to be pre faithfully present with someone in the midst of pain, um, uh, particularly at the end of life? So th that's just one small way. Um, David or Andy, do either, one, either of you want to respond to that at all in terms of what does it look like to express love in a way that might be different from what the world thinks? Well, I would say um, I think honesty is one of the m most important expressions of love. Um, I think it's very... You know, if we're trying to develop people and grow people, I mean, if you think about your own children, you know, you really are trying to be honest with them. You're trying to really assess their capabilities. You're trying to make sure that they, you, there's some element of discipline to that. Uh, the evaluation processes that we use all the time, I think, are very important as part of loving someone. I mean, if they're not doing a great job, they need to know they're not doing a good job and why, and then they need an opportunity to change. That's really growth. Just say, telling someone, well, you're doing okay, is no help at all. That's not loving. And so uh, I, I think that level of honesty, which is then built in, an, but that can only happen when there's an environment of trust. Because if there's not an environment of trust in an organization, then that kind of direct feedback will not be heard well. It's only when you have a history of trust with people that they'll say, you know, I got some tough feedback today but I really trust that the guy that gave me that feedback is honest, that was legitimate, he's not trying to do anything negative towards me, and, and I got some work to do to, to get better, and I can get better. You wanna go or pass? You can pass. Yeah, well, next question. Okay, we, we've got a lot of other questions, so that's great. Um, there's one specifically for you, but I'm gonna ask it more broadly, but I'm gonna have you, David, respond to it first, and that is, um, who has had the most personal impact on you in shaping your view of integrating your faith with your work? Um, the question for you was, do you have mentors at Boeing? Uh, but more broadly, and for, for the whole panel, who's helped you with this? What does that look like? How, how does that mentorship play out for you? Yeah, I could think of um, two mentors. The first one was uh, when I was in college. It was my strength and conditioning coach. And uh, he taught us a really good lesson, which was you can't or you should not, in essence, be looking for the the praise of man, and that you should be keeping your eyes on where, where God is, where you know what He's looking at. Um, his biggest thing was on the football field was you got to be willing to, in essence, die for Christ, um, but you got to be willing to have the worst play ever happen to you, mm -hmm. and still be able to walk off the field knowing that you're loved by God. Um, so that's what I kind of carried into the work life, and then another mentor um, at Boeing, which helped me navigate. Um, was an individual, kind of speaking back to the last question, um, that taught me that it's about people. Um, so he asked me, it was only two years in the company, he said, you know, why do we do this? I said, sell airplanes. He was like, wrong. Uh, well, I was like, um, to keep people safe when they fly. He was like, wrong. And I was like, okay. um, to make money, wrong. And so, he's, so he said, it's about the people. He said, uh, look around. We're kind of like in a, a large building, kind of the size of here. He said, look around. It's about the people here. And he said, and if you can actually get the certain engineers to, to know that you care about them, you can do amazing things. It's not going to be because you give them the focus on how many airplanes we sell. So that was a, a really good lesson that that mentor taught me. Anybody else want to address that mentor question? I would just say that uh, you know, I'm a little older, so early on, I, I guess there was a split. I had people who mentored me for my faith 
and people who mentored me on work, but not with faith. They were just work folks. So people I work for historically, my father, uh, and then some, some uh, great Christian brothers that came along. I think it's only in the last maybe eight to 10 years that I've, I've found, I guess I would describe as peers, that I can actually talk about these kinds of issues with, but it's made me determined to help find other people to mentor. Uh, and that's kind of one of my, the, my main roles, I feel, is to be a mentor, because it's something I didn't really get, the integration of faith, work, mentorship, and it's so critical, because it's complex. We have about a minute and a half left, and there is a question that I think every single table now has upvoted, which is for Andy specifically, but I think it's also broader than this. And it says, Andy, tell us about applying faith when the return on an investment sucks. But I think the broader question is, what does your faith look like when life isn't going well and it's not what you expected or hoped or were wanting? Well, if anybody's been watching the stock market over the last couple of days, <laughs> it sucks. But I'm still here. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we work, the way we think about it is we work today, but we then have an eternal perspective. And we sort of don't have a middle because the middle depends on what God does. You know, we feel that we're responsible for the process, but God is responsible for the outcome. And ultimately we have, a, uh, we have an eternal perspective. So, you know, if you're just focusing on today, doing the best you can, um, you, you recognize that these things, uh, my partner has a phrase, he said, within, within the range of expectation, the normal expectations, these things happen. Some are good, some are bad. But as long as you've done the best you can, then the outcome, we leave it to God. And you just have to let, let it go. Anybody else want to tackle that one real quickly? I'll do real quick. Um, you know, the thing that, that whenever you said that, that struck me, and that was the fact that, you know, we... We talk about doing what is right, you know, and loving people and reaching out is doing what is right. And sometimes it's very difficult because it's very unconditional. And so I remember this one gentleman who really began to struggle and to wrestle with the fact of what does it mean to do what is right and to love people and to love his employees. And he really had done so many great things of knowing their stories. And, and he was in a meeting and he shares about the fact that he was in this meeting and he, you know, was, the union was there and the, they were asking him to do something. And so he was wrestling with wrestling it and he took his piece of chalk and he threw it across the room and he hit the blackboard and he said, in very colorful words, which I won't say now, but he said, I know what is the right thing to do. I just don't want to do it because it meant that he had to go and cross the line and do something and to be with his manager that it was above him to really go, f you know, go for this, you know, something that he just didn't want to have to do that. And he finally did say, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And it's like, so it's tough things. And it's like, is it right to do? And that's, and that was, you know, something that was meaningful. <laughs> I hope you still have questions, and if you do, um, tomorrow at 11, there is a breakout session. There's a, a number of breakout sessions, but one of the breakout sessions will be with this group of, of folks from the plenary tonight, and they'll be available to answer additional questions. So that's in your app. You can see where that will be. Um, but if you do have further questions that you want to follow up with these folks, they can, you can do that in a smaller room setting and have more conversation with them. Um, a couple of other things um, just to note before we finish tonight. Immediately following this plenary, there is a reception right outside. Um, that reception is sponsored by the Mockler Center for Faith and Ethics at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Um, the mission of the Mockler Center is to serve the seminary, the church, the marketplace, and society as a whole by exploring the intersections of faith, work, and economics. Tonight, they're living out this mission by serving you all. Um, please thank folks from the Mockler Center as you see them. Um, thank you for a very wonderful session. Tomorrow morning, we start back up in this room at 8 a.m. with breakfast. Breakfast is from 8 to 9. So we will see you then. And if you join me in thanking our panelists one more time. Thank you.